Hello, everyone. Welcome to the IPNA Indoors Webmaster Series 2022. This is a pediatric tubular disease symposium. We have been having the webinars from July 9th, and this goes on till August 24th. It has been a very rich academic feast, and we have had excellent speakers from all over the world. This is the ninth webinar in the series, and we have two excellent speakers today. The first talk is on calcium sensing receptors to be given by Dr. Swasti Chaudhary from uh, Australia. And then the second speaker today, we have Dr. Kalaiwani Ganeshan. Due to unavoidable circumstances, our speaker, Dr. Sudha, could not join us today, but Dr. Kalavani has stepped in and we would be looking forward for her talk. At the end of the session, we will have a polling session as well. This is uh, the second last session, so be sure that you uh, join, attend those. And as we know that there are cash prizes for those, the results of the polling sessions would be announced on August 17th. And then we would also request all the winners to be present on August 24th uh, for due recognition. With this, uh, I would like to first introduce our chairperson for today's session. And this is Dr. Manoj Matnani. Uh, Dr. Matnani is professor at Dr. D.Y. Partal Medical College in Pune. And he's also a consultant pediatric nephrologist at Jahangir Hospital and KM Hospital in Pune. His special academic interests include nephrotic syndrome, tubulopathies, and pediatric renal transplantation. He has won national awards. He has been named the Dynamic Indian of the Millennium, and this was in 2019. He has also been awarded gold medal, and he has also won award for his research work on nutritional values of topical oil application in neonates. Thank you so much for joining Dr. Matnani. Uh, I will hand over the session to you. So thank you so much, Dr. Jain. And, uh... Before I begin introducing Dr. Shweta, let me just immensely thank the entire Mehta Children's Hospital team, Dr. Namalwar, who's always there with us, the stalwart who introduced pediatric nephrology to the south of India, Dr. Kalaiwani and Dr. Amrish to give me this opportunity. And let me tell you honestly, I never miss these sessions. It's a big uh, recap of all the basics which we have studied and all of the de new developments which the speakers definitely enlighten us. So uh, let me uh, put it on in front of you. You can see in this on the screen, it's Dr. Shweta Prayadarshini. She'll be moderating the sessions today. So she's a senior consultant in pediatric nephrology at the Apollo Hospital, Jubilee Hills in Hyderabad, and also in Butterflies Pediatric Specialty Clinics there. She's also an adjunct associate professor in pediatric nephrology at the AHERF. Uh, her training is from the armed forces, and she was trained in pediatric nephrology at Harvard Medical School, Boston. She's also got a fellowship from MGR University in Chennai and the ISPN, that's the Indian Society of Pediatric Nephrology. She's a member of various societies, as you can see, and also has multiple national and international publications and has contributed to multiple book chapters as well. So without much ado, I would pass it on to uh, Dr. Shweta. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Matnani, for this uh, introduction. And I would really echo what you have said that, you know, about the sessions and uh, thank you, Namalwar sir, Dr. Kalaiwani, Dr. Amrish for uh, uh, having me here at the session and organizing these sessions. Thank you so much. So without uh, delay, we'll just go ahead and start with the sessions. So our first speaker is Dr. Swasti Ch Chaturvedi, and she is a clinical lead in pediatric nephrology at Royal Darwin Hospital, Darwin and a visiting pediatric nephrologist at Alice Springs Hospital, Alice Springs in Northern Territory, Australia. Her academic interests include uh, indigenous health and has been, uh, she, she is passionate, passionate about indi uh, indigenous health and has a keen interest in advocacy for health equity and reducing healthcare disparities. Her uh, accomplishments, Dr. Swasti Chaturvedi is currently the clinical lead in pediatric nephrology at the Royal Darwin Hospital, Northern Territory, Australia. She initiated the first pediatric nephrology clinics at the Royal Darwin Hospital and the Alice Springs Hospital. She completed her pediatric nephrology training at Royal Children's Hospital, Melbourne, and the, sick ho and the hospital for sick, sick children, Toronto, Canada. She is a member of several national and international committees. So over to Dr. Swasti Chaturvedi. Um, thank you. I was, I'm going to share my screen. One minute. Um, I would like to 
uh, first of all, thank the organizers, the Meta Children Hospital, Dr. Kalaiwani, Dr. Amrish, and Dr. Nawalwar, of course, again. Um, thank you for giving me this opportunity, and let's begin. So my topic of today is calcium and calcium sensing receptor disorders. Um, this is the outline of my talk. Um, I will briefly talk about calcium homeostasis and then talk about the conditions causing hypocalcemia and hypercalcemia, including calcium sensing receptor disorders, particularly. And then moving on, I will discuss briefly calcium mimetics and calcilytics, an exciting new uh, paradigm uh, medications in this horizon, and then summarize my talk. Uh, so we all know that calcium plays a critical role in multiple body functions, including bone matrix mineralization, a neuronal and neuromuscular function, blood coagulation, and intracellular processes, um, including signal transduction and synthesis and secretion of hormones. Uh, coming to the calcium homeostasis, of the total calcium in the body, 99% resides in our skeletal system, bones and teeth, 1% is in intracellular fluid, and only 0.1% resides in the extracellular fluid. Of the extracellular fluid calcium, in the total serum calcium, 40% is bound to albumin, 10% is complex to other anions, citrate and uh, phosphate, and only 50% is the unbound ionized calcium, which is the critical uh, player in the all the uh, uh, calcium uh, uh, processes, as I discussed above. The total calcium is about 9 to 10.5 milligram per deciliter, or we can say it's 2.5 millimole per liter, uh, because the calcium has a valency, if you say it, it could also say five milliequivalent because of all the international audience. <laughs> um, but basically, one millimole of calcium is equal to 40 milligrams, and that's how you take it from 10.5 milligram per dl to 2.5 millimole per liter. Of this, 40% is non ultra filtrable calcium and it's bound to the proteins, whereas 60% is ultra filtrable, which includes the ionized calcium and the complex anion uh, calcium. The Problem with the protein bound calcium is that it's impacted by changes in the blood protein level and ionized calcium is also impacted by the pH changes. So for each one gram decrease, uh, one gram per deciliter decrease in serum albumin, the total serum calcium decreases by 0.8 milligram per dl. So we need to be aware of that. And in acute alkalosis, there is a reduction in ionized calcium. So rapid uh, correction of the acidosis may lead to uh, decline in the calcium. So first also make sure the calcium is corrected before we do ra any rapid correction of any acidosis. For every 0.1 change in pH, ionized calcium changes by 0.12 milligram per dl. So the average adult uh, uh, calcium intake is 1000 milligram per day and approximately 400 milligram of dietary uh, calcium is absorbed by the intestine. And again, out of that 200 milligram is lost in the intestinal secretion. So net uh, actually absorption is only 20%. And in the steady state, intestinal absorption will be matched by urinary excretion. So the kidney excretes only 2% of the filtered load. And this kidney is the principal regulatory organ for extracellular calcium balance. No surprises there. So the daily recommended intake increases over from birth to uh, adulthood up to 1300 milligrams per day. And these are the calcium rich uh, sources as, as probably everybody knows. And these are the calcium supplements based and based on the, the calcium carbonate has the maximum percentage of elemental calcium. And this needs to be considered when you're supplementing calcium so to, to reduce the tablet burden followed by calcium acetate, lactate and so on. So regulation of the calcium level, ionized calcium concentration is regulated by three hormones, PTH, calcitriol to lesser extent calcitonin, three target organs, parathyroid gland, bone, kidney, and a key sensor of calcium sensing receptor to detect the ECF calcium concentration. And calcium sensing receptor is a G protein coupled receptor. It has an extracellular domain, a transmembrane domain, and an intracellular domain. It is expressed on the plasma surface of the chief cells in the parathyroid gland, basolateral membrane of thick ascending limb of loop of Henle, and apical membrane of collecting duct, and also in various other organs of the body. It's a very widespread, but this is where the main role in calcium uh, homeostasis is taking place. And so to summarize the action of regulatory uh, hormones, vitamin D, as we all know, uh, this pathway I, uh, needs no introduction. It has been taught from NBBS onwards to us. 
um, that we get the vitamin D from skin and diet. It is converted to 25 hydroxy vitamin D in liver, and then subsequently converted to final form of 125 dihydroxy vitamin D in kidney. Uh, and then it increases the calcium absorption in intestine, bony resorption of the calcium, and decreases the calcium and phosphate excretion, thus increasing the calcium levels in the body. Um, and so obviously, uh, any diseases impacting liver or kidney will impact the vitamin D level and uh, eventually calcium levels. And uh, to summarize the hormones, so we have already discussed vitamin D. What's the role of the PTH? Uh, PTH increase is, cares deeply about the calcium. It increases the calcium level by absorption from bone and reducing the renal excretion. It does not care much about phosphate. Actually, it increases renal excretion of phosphate and increase, though it does increase the absorption of phosphate from intestine. Calcitonin, which is the least studied of the hormones, reduces the osteoclastic activity and uh, formation of new osteoclast and it actually acts in the opposite direction to vitamin D and PTH. So coming to calcium sensing receptor, the, in the parathyroid gland, um, the uh, calcium levels are sensed by uh, the CASR, which inhibit the PTH release. And this is mediated by activating the phospholipase C, which acts on the phosphatidyl inositol diphosphate to uh, uh, Act on the diacyl glycerol and inositol uh, convert it to convert it into diacyl glycerol and inositol triphosphate. And through these pathways, it causes the release of calcium from the endoplasmic reticulum. And this leads to the uh, reduction in the PTH secretion. Whereas low calcium level is sensed by CSR and leads to the PTH release. PTH then acts via the PTH uh, related protein on bones, kidney, and intestine to normalize the calcium level. This is an important graph because it shows that. The, there is an inverse sigmoidal relationship between ionized calcium concentration and PTH release from the parathyroid gland. So as the calcium level will drop, the PTH release will rise. So coming to the, um, coming to the CSR. CSR on the cell surface of the chief cells in parathyroid gland will sense the reduction in serum calcium concentration and lead to PTH secretion. And then PTH will act via the PTH-related peptide, as I said, to increase renal calcium absorption, increase the absorption of calcium in the gut, and also bony resorption, leading to rise in the uh, extracellular calcium and normalization of the serum calcium levels. When the PTH acts on the bone, interestingly, phosphate is also released, of course. The phosphate can bind with the calcium, thus preventing the correction of hypocalcemia. So this is counteracted by the PTH action on renal tubules to produce phosphaturia as discussed in the previous slide. CSR is actually also expressed in other tissues and plays an important role in lung and neuronal development, vascular tone, GI sensing, insulin, everything actually. And abnormal expression has now been reported in the contribution of the pathogenesis of cardiovascular disease, asthma, Alzheimer's, breast and colon cancers. So it's a widespread action. How is calcium handled in the gut? Mainly the calcium is absorbed by two mechanisms, the active pathway, where, which is one, uh, which is final, uh, like uh, 125 dihydroxy vitamin D mediated, which acts through the transient uh, receptor potential venyloid 6 or TRIP-P6 channel on the apical membrane of duodenum and proximal jejunum, where calcium binds to the TRIP-P6 and intracellularly binds to calbindin and exits the cell at the interstitial or blood end through the uh, calcium ATPase. The rest of the intestine has a paracellular calcium transport, which is passive throughout the length of the intestine. How about the handling of calcium in the kidney? With the GFR of 170 liters, actually roughly 10 grams of calcium would be lost from the body. So we lose everything only, but how, fortunately kidneys are very intelligent organ and we get only 100 to 200 milligram of finally calcium is excreted in urine, giving the fractional excretion of only 2%. Hence, the kidney fine tunes it along the way, and 98 to 99 percent of the filtered load is of the calcium is fine absorbed, reabsorbed by the renal tubule. Of this, 65 percent happens in the uh, proximal tubule, and 25 percent in the thick ascending limb of loop of Henle. And both of these are mainly paracellular pathways of passive absorption, along with sodium drag, uh, along with the sodium active absorption of the sodium. Uh, and 8 percent happens in the DCT and connecting tubule, which is transcellular. Collecting duct normally does not have any calcium absorption. It will do it if it is required. Fine tuning may be happen only if it is required. 
the DCT, the terminal end of the uh, renal tubules, though responsible for the reabsorption of very small amount of filtered calcium load, are major site for regulation. So 80% of the calcium absorption in the proximal tubule is passive. Through paracellular pathway, only 10 to 15% is active, as I said. And in the, limb of, uh, sorry, in the loop of Henley, it's passive again, whereas in the DCT-CT, it's transcellular. Let's walk, take a walk down the kidney tubule. So in the proximal tubule, the calcium absorption is paracellular through claudine pores and happens as a result of the active absorption of sodium via the sodium proton pump, which then exits and then sodium exits uh, via the sodium potassium ATPase at the basolateral membrane. So this is the luminal or the urine end, and this is the basolateral or the blood end. So with this uh, for, uh, a favorable electrochemical gradient is created, thus leading to passive absorption of calcium and water. Let's uh, walk to the thick ascending limb of loop of Henley. I'm sure you're all familiar with this uh, cut, uh, diagram. There are a lot of channels. I'm going to very briefly describe them. So basically, the sodium here is actively absorbed so through sodium potassium to chloride channel. But uh, immediately, the sodium will exit at, again at the basolateral end through this AT, uh, potassium sodium ATPase. And the uh, potassium is immediately recycled back into the lumen by the renal outer medullary channel. And even the chloride exits through the chloride channel, which is not shown here, but basically this will create a, again, a favorable electrochemical gradient for absorption of calcium and magnesium through the clotting. Uh, so, and if any of these channels are uh, mutated, we all know that it can result in different types of barter. So barter one, barter two, like, and so on. Um, and then coming to the distal uh, tubule and connecting uh, duct, uh, connecting uh, segment. Again, here, the, uh, as we all know, there is a sodium uh, chloride channel. Uh, and in the connecting segment, there will be ENEC. Uh, the calcium is here actually actively absorbed through the trip P5, similar to what we saw in the duodenum and jejunum. It binds to, then it binds intracellularly to calbindin and then exits to calcium ATPase and calcium sodium ATPase at the basolateral end. In the collecting duct, not much absorption of the calcium happens, as I said, but CSR is there. So why is there an apical CSR even in the collecting duct when no calcium is being absorbed? So basically, it controls the amount of uh, 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 fluid, I mean, urinary concentration. So if a lot of calcium is being ex uh, excreted, say there is hypercalciuria, then the calcium sensor uh, causes reduction in aquaporin insertion in the disc collecting duct, leading to dilute urine and prolonged hypercalcemia is related to polyuria, as we all know. Similarly, sorry, going back to the ascending limb, thick ascending limb, there is a CSR at the basolateral end. Remember, we talked about where is the CSR at the, in the thick ascending limb. And again, it can cause uh, activation of CSR can uh, lead to uh, can lead to inhibition of the sodium and the potassium channels and reduction in the calcium. So if there is hypercalcemia, the sensor gets activated and that leads to reduction in calcium reabsorption. Coming to hypercalcemia in children, um, so uh, sorry, hypocalcemia in children and the causes of hypocalcemia. So it, I will take a brief overview and then specifically talk about the se calcium sensor defects. So hypocalcemia is defined as calcium, total serum calcium less than 8.8 .8 milligram per DL. And it can be broadly remembered as hypocalcemia with low PTH, which will be hypoparathyroidism, and hypocalcemia with high PTH, which will be vitamin D deficiency or vitamin D rickets, where you have resistance to vitamin D, or less commonly, you have pseudo hypoparathyroidism, which means you have resistance to parathyroid. So basically, only low PTH and high PTH can be, it's easy to remember that way when you're approaching a child with a hypocalcemia. Approach to diagnosis depends also on age of presentation, birth history, maternal vitamin D status, family history, clinical exam, of course. So it can be, causes can be broadly divided into neonatal period presenting in infancy, childhood, and adolescence. In neonatal period, again, it's divided into early, which is first 72 hours of life, and late after 72 hours of life. Early neonatal period, usually it's a sick neonate with prematurity because, as you know, calcium accretion happens, majority of calcium accretion up to 50% happens in the third trimester from the mother to the fetus. So if the baby is born premature or has IUGR, then obviously they may be already at risk. 
and then infant of diabetic mother because they have immaturity of parathyroid gland, fetal parathyroid gland. And then late after 72 hours, usually presents from dietary phenomenon like cow's milk, uh, uh, giving cow's milk to an infant leading to high phosphate load or TPN low in uh, calcium or high for having high phosphate. And then the congenital hypoparathyroidism or syndromic causes start taking place. So this is the autosomal dominant hypocalcemia, which is a calcium sensing receptor defect, which I will discuss in detail. And then there are numerous other syndromes like D. George's syndrome and HDR syndrome, which is hypoparathyroidism, deafness and renal dysplasia. I'm not gonna be discussing everything because there are multiple syndromes involved. We can't remember all of them, but at least if you remember the approach and the timing of presentation, we can it is helpful in reaching the diagnosis and management. And then maternal hyperparathyroidism or maternal vitamin D deficiency, et cetera. Osteopetrosis is unique because it, in this, there is reduction in osteoclastic activity. So that's why there is hypocalcemia. Again, in infancy, there will be delayed presentation of the syndromic or syndromic hypoparathyroidism, but a vitamin D deficiency in rickets starts coming into picture as the maternal um, stores become uh, reduced. And now it's totally dependent on the diet which the child is taking. And then childhood and adolescence, more autoimmune stuff like polyendocrinopathies and other um, things become come into picture. But vitamin D deficiency, of course, remains lifelong cause of uh, hypocalcemia. When approaching a child, uh, uh, do a head to toe exam as, as you always do and check for any growth, all the growth parameters, look for impaired growth, heart murmur, that might give a clue to DJOR syndrome, bony abnormalities, developmental delay, which may be associated with syndromes. Interestingly, it is a, a very rare condition called polyendocrinopathy syndrome, where you have autoimmune destruction of multiple hormonal organs and endocrine organs. And that can be associated with mucocutaneous candidiasis. Um, and uh, other things like tumor lysis, where you will have to look for lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomic LE, and if there is any features of uh, pseudo hypoparathyroidism. So, uh, examination will give you a lot of clues. So, now coming to a case now, a three year old girl uh, comes from, for a dental procedure under general anesthesia for multiple carious teeth requiring extraction. Past history is significant for complex cardiac anatomy and perinatal hypocalcemia. She underwent patch closure of the VSD, ASD and at seven weeks of age and had a brief period of hypocalcemia post-surgery. But currently, she, you're told she's not on anything. She doesn't need any calcium or vitamin D supplementation. And she looks like this. So what is the condition of this child? Are there any routine bloods required perioperatively before the dental procedure? In the interest of, uh, because this is not, a, I will keep going. So as you can see, this is a very uh, specific facial features, including depressed nasal bridge, flat, uh, flat nasal bridge, absent philtrum, and uh, very long face. Um, so this is associated uh, with a DJOR syndrome. Her investigation showed that um, uh, adjusted plasma calcium was quite low, 1.5. PTH was actually still uh, uh, not high enough because of because DJOR syndrome, as you know, is associated with hypo, uh, pa sorry, parathyroid hypoplasia or absent parathyroid. Uh, and phosphate was okay and vitamin D levels were actually normal. So uh, this condition has, uh, is called, uh, multiple names are given to this condition, various names like 22Q deletion, below cardiofacial, CASH22 and DJOR syndrome, and it can lead to hypocalcemia. The message here is that even if the, uh, the calcium ca requirement is not there, it can come back during periods of stress or during periods of surgery. So please check even if they're not on um, calcium. And interestingly, it is also associated with CACOT in 40% cases for us nephrologists. Uh, so there's two things which we have to remember. And this is absent thymus and again, a very particular specific facies which these children have. Case two is a four-year-old child presenting with 5 kg weight loss, gum bleeding, and distended abdomen. On examination, irritable, malnourished child with generalized lymphadenopathy and hepatosplenomegaly. And these are his investigations. He has got pancytopenia. There are myeloblasts, elevated LDH, uric acid, elevate, uh, there's some uh, acute kidney injury as well. So this is a, most likely a tumor lysis syndrome. And usually we are taught that tumor lysis syndrome presents once you start chemotherapy, but in huge tumor burden, it can even present earlier before even starting chemotherapy. 
So tumor lysis syndrome can occur spontaneously. Or more often, it occurs after starting chemotherapy. And it's caused by the uh, uh, destruction of the cells and release of the intracellular contents leading to hyperphosphatemia, hypocalcemia, hyperkalemia, and urate nephropathy. And nowadays with the arrival of resburicase, I mean, previously only alloprenol was in our armitarium. With resburicase, the incidence has declined, but not disappeared. So it, it is good to be aware of it. So coming to the hypocalcemic disorders associated with activating mutations of CASR. So I have shown you this um, sigmoid curve of the calcium PTH relationship. And so in the activating mutations actually shift the curve to the left, which means there is increased sensitivity to the calcium, very interestingly. And so this decreases the set point of the CSR. So the PTH will not be released at the serum concent calcium concentration, which normally trigger the PTH. So the activating mutation actually says to CSR, enough calcium is there even as the calcium is dropping. So that's why the PTH is not released and the child is becoming hypocalcemic and hypocalcemic. So just to this cartoon, the normal response of CSR to serum calcium level is, is if this is the parathyroid cell, this is the CSR on the cell surface. Say if the calcium level rises, there is inhibition of PTH release and PTH levels won't, PTH won't be secreted, right? And if the calcium level drops, this inhibition is released, removed, and PTH is actually secreted. But what happens when there's activating mutation? So this is the active, very a hyperactive uh, channel now, okay? So calcium is declining. This inhibition is still maintained because it's so hyperactive, it's so much sensitive to even little bit of calcium that PTH does not rise. And uh, these are the conditions which are associated with this activating mutation. So there is autosomal dominant hypocalcemia one and autosomal dominant hypocalcemia two. So the autosomal dominant hypocalcemia one is due to the activating mutation in the CSR itself. Whereas the ADH2, as you remember, there is this channel pathway, which uh, after the activation of the uh, calcium sensing receptor, it acts via the phospholipase C and G alpha 11. So G alpha 11 mutations will cause autosomal dominant hypocalcemia type two. And interestingly, if you have autoantibodies against uh, activating antibodies against CSR in at adolescent child, say, or older adult, it can cause autoimmune hypercalciuric hypocalcemia. So the child is hypocalcemic, still there is hypercalciuria because of the CSR activating mutation. In the, remember, because it's in the kidneys also. So this is the summary slide for these uh, uh, conditions. So ADH1, again, these are autosomal dominant, as I said, so no, uh, no further explanation is required. So one bad allele can cause it, like it can be inherited from either parent and 50% uh, will be symptomatic. There is uh, literature describes at least 35% will have ectopic calcification and basal ganglia calcification, and 10% have hypercalciuria. This is variable, and it can lead to nephrocalcinosis and kidney stones. And, and very interestingly, another uh, condition is called Barter syndrome type 5, which is affecting more of kidneys and less of ADH1. It depends on the type of the mutation, what phenotype a child will have. In this, both are CASR mutation, activating mutation of CSR, but it depends on the type of mutation, whether they will be more barter-like or whether they will present as autosomal dominant hypocalcemia. So it's a gain of function mutation, as I've already discussed. Um, so coming to the barter syndrome type 5, it is again caused by the activating mutation in CSR, and that Remember that inhibits the activity of the sodium channel and the ROMK channel, and that will stop the absorption of the sodium, and in turn, that will stop the absorption of the calcium. This will lead to hypercalciuria and hypocalcemia, but along with it, it also causes Barter syndrome with hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis and all sorts of like hyperanemic, all the features of Barter syndrome. So what are the clinical manifestations of hypocalcemia? I'm sure most of you are aware it can cause uh, neurological irritability, neuronal irritability, muscular irritability. So it causes titany, laryngospasm, muscle cramps, seizures. And then we were always taught about these chocolate signs and trozo signs. And trozo sign is when you uh, inflate the uh, uh, cuff above the SBP for three minutes, there's scapopedal spasm. 
and tufted stand is ipsilateral facial muscle as visited by tapping the facial nerve just anterior to the ear. And uh, also, as you know, there will be lengthen, lengthening of the QTC interval. So what are the investigations we should do when we are approaching a child with hypocalcemia? We should at least include the basic bone profile, calcium, magnesium, phosphate, ALP, albumin, and of course, creatinine and electrolytes. If possible, please do include PTH. It really helps, as I said, uh, and urine calcium creatinine ratio. The normal urine calcium creatinine is actually, if you do 24 hour collection, it's four milligram per kg, less than, it should be less than four milligram per kg per day. 24 hour collections are cumbersome, in, and especially in non toilet trained children, it will be hard. So, spot calcium creatinine ratios are done, and they are actually uh, quite interpretable, and uh, they have been shown to have good correlation with 24 hour. And so they are age dependent, but in an older child, it should be less than 0.2 milligram per milligram. And uh, in, it is higher in the younger children, less than one year. And also uh, we should also do, uh, of course, take this family history, as I said, for any inherited stuff, any autoimmune stuff, and also vitamin D deficiency. Further testing, of course, we have to look into radiology for any um, chest X-rays, renal ultrasound to identify nephrocalcinosis and chest X-ray in infants for cardiomegaly. Why cardiomegaly? Because prolonged hypocalcemia can also lead to cardiomyopathy and cardiac failure. So that's why it is recommended. But you should be able to clinically also uh, make out. Um, so approach to hypocalcemia, this is something which I have tried to uh, summarize. So hypocalcemia child is magnesium low, correct magnesium because otherwise, Calcium will not be corrected. As you know, magnesium also binds to CSR and also magnesium can also inhibit PTS secretion. If like if low magnesium inhibits the PTS secretion, sorry. So we have to correct the magnesium before we can correct the calcium. And also rule out CKD, which is basic. Make sure the creatinine is normal because in CKD, chronic kidney disease, high phosphate can drop the calcium. Uh, high phosphate can drop the calcium. Then Taking it from there, if you have a PTH, depending on high PTH, remember, and low PTH. Low PTH will be all the hy uh, hypoparathyroidisms mostly. And high PTH will be vitamin D deficiencies or pseudo hypoparathyroidisms. So it, then check the phosphate level. If it is high phosphate and high PTH, then it's likely to be parathyroid hormone resistance. If it is high phosphate, high PTH and low phosphate, it's likely to be vitamin D deficiency or resistance. If it's low PTH, obviously, as I said, it has to be one of the causes of inherited or acquired causes of hypoparathyroidism, actually. Uh, in adolescent, it could be autoimmune. In children, it could be congenital. If it is normal PTH, that's when the calcium sensing receptor comes into play. The, uh, the calcium sensing uh, uh, receptor problems are the key here. So that's where the urine calcium creatinine ratio is most useful. If it is increased despite in the face of hypocalcemia, then it is autosomal dominant hypocalcemia due to activating mutation of the CSR. And if it is reduced or appropriate, then it has to be hypoparathyroidism. Treatment, actually treatment depends if there is actually symptoms like seizures and the underlying cause. If the child is symptomatic, intravenous bolus is the most uh, at least over 10 minutes and with cardiac monitoring is required. And we should discontinue IV as soon as possible and uh, never stop suddenly, of course, either IV or oral, always taper it down. And uh, non-urgent, uh, if in a mildly asymptomatic child, just give oral calcium, which is more safer because IV calcium, if it extravasates, it can cause necrosis of the skin and subcutaneous tissue. So if it's going to be long IV, then central line is preferred. And also treat concurrent hypomagnesemia, as I have mentioned before. So long-term management of hypoparathyroidism and pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, actually long-term vitamin D analogs will be required, like alpha-calcidol or calcitriol. Calcium supplements usually can be stopped after the acute phase. Uh, and the aim is to maintain just the lower end. This is the key. When you are following them up for longer time, these children, please try and maintain at the lower end because you don't want to cause hypercalciuria, nephrocalcinosis, and then chronic kidney disease. And always check the calcium during the period of, of intercurrent illness or stress as it will obviously increase. The requirements might increase. 
And if it is vitamin D deficiency, of course, you know what how to treat vitamin D deficiency. If it is depend, uh, vitamin D dependent rickets type one, which is due to one alpha hydroxylase deficiency, then final form of calcium, uh, sorry, vitamin D will be required. If it's actually resistance to the vitamin D, then of course, calcium infusions are required. These are all rare disorders. More common is nutritional vitamin D deficiency. So coming to hypercalcemia in children, it's more likely to be of clinical significance in pediatric patient than in adults. Actually, this is interesting. And uh, as you know, the baseline calcium levels are age dependent and higher in younger children because they need to, uh, higher calcium for growth than adults. So, uh, and as you grow older, your calcium levels will not, no normal reference range drops. And um, hypercalcemia is defined as uh, total calcium more than 10.2, or ionized calcium, which is 50% of the total, roughly, unless there are pH changes. And of course, as I say, uh, uh, so it will be more than 5.6 milligram per dl. So also can be defined by mild, moderate, severe. Severe is more than 14 gram per dl. Moderate is more between 12 to 14, and mild is less than 12. Again, I like to have an approach so that when I'm looking at the child, we can decide what is it, what's the cause. So etiology, we can be classified again as PTH dependent or PTH independent. PTH independent hypercalcemia is associated with appropriately low PTH, means hi hi normal hypercalcemia responses to lower the PTH. And it's much more common in children than the PTH driven response. Sorry, PTH dependent hypercalcemia. Again, the uh, some uh, text also define it as, as etiology as resorptive, absorptive, and reabsorptive. And I like that also because it helps in thinking through. So if there is immobilization, uh, a child who is bedridden or has severe developmental delay, it's more likely to be resorptive hypercalcemia. Enhanced gastrointestinal absorption can happen when there are vitamin D secreting tumors or subcutaneous fat necrosis where vitamin D is being actually either externally or internally produced or externally toxic, like excessive vitamin D in diet or internally. So that can lead to absorptive hypercalcemia. And increased renal tubular reabsorption is called reabsorptive hypercalcemia. And this is seen in the calcium sensing receptor defects again. So this uh, graph shows that if, as I said, resorptive will be seen in immobilization and malignancy. And uh, the other ones, as I say, the absorptive will be seen in any condition which leads to vitamin D excess inside the body. Whereas the reabsorptive ones are usually due to uh, actually inherited problems or mutations in the calcium sensing receptor or actually thiazides also do that and we'll discuss that. And the other last option is high, actual hyperparathyroidism due to adenoma, which is quite rare in children, but can happen in older children, primary hyperparathyroidism. So case three is an 11-month-old child who was brought in by parents for complaint of constipation, cough, fever, poor growth. She has facial dysmorphism, hypertension, and murmur. She had one episode of seizure at one, six months of age. Her investigations, her full blood count is actually not too remarkable, but there is hypercalcemia. And actually, the urine spot calcium creatinine ratio is also high, as is 24-hour calcium. The PTH is okay, and the vitamin D levels, again, are replete. So what is this condition? So, sorry, uh, this is called Williams syndrome. I'm sure uh, quite a few people would have seen this syndrome. It's often seen in uh, cardiac clinics. We has a characteristic facial features. They have very pleasant personality. They come across as very friendly, gregarious people, children. Actually, they have intellectual disability. Um, and they also can have, act interestingly, infantile hypocalcemia. And of course, the basic, uh, the key uh, cardiac defect is supravalvular aortic stenosis, but other cardiac defects are also uh, known. And it is due to micro deletion of, chromos uh, uh, of the chromosome 7Q which leads to the suppression of the elastin gene. And the cause of the hypocal hypercalcemia in this case is not known. It is thought to be mediated either via calcitonin or uh, on the osteoclastic activity, but it's not clear cut defined. So coming to the hypercalcemic disorders associated with inactivating mutations of the calcium sensing receptor. So again, coming to that sigmoid curve, remember, 
the inactivating mutations shift the calcium PTH curve to the right. So higher concentration of calcium will be required to suppress the PTH release, thus causing hypercalcemia, as illustrated in this diagram. So they're usually, as, you, as I described earlier, if calcium is higher, it goes up in the blood, the calcium sensing receptor senses that calcium and has an inhibition on the PTH secretion. But if you have inactivating mutation, higher calcium does not um, uh, lead to suppression of the PTH and PTH keeps rising, inappropriately rising. And the inactivating mutation can be either uh, one gene involvement, which is familial hypocalciuric hypercalcemia, which is normally asymptomatic, or it can also, if there are two alleles involved, uh, they can lead to neonatal severe hyperparathyroidism, which is a life-threatening condition requiring parathyroid testing. And again, inactivating antibodies in older children can similarly result in to the antibodies to the CSR can cause autoimmune hypocalciuric hypercalcemia. So this slide summarizes the, all the CSR-related uh, conditions causing hypercalcemia. As I said, this is familial hypocalciuric, uh, hypercalcemia type 1, type 2 and 3. And I will, uh, uh, these are due to, type 2 and 3 are due to different uh, mut mutations in different genes that, again, regulating the CSR, which I've already shown, GNS alpha. And the APS2 is the adapter protein responsible for clathrin-mediated endocytosis of the CSR. So, but these are involved in the CSR pathway, actually downstream signaling of the CSR. So in the FSH, FHH1, majority are asymptomatic and two also majority asympt asymptomatic. So no treatment is required. No unnecessary parathyroidectomy should be done actually, uh, because then you are uh, forcing the child to be on lifelong calcium supplementation and vitamin or vitamin D. So, so it should not be uh, done. The, it only requires simply looking into family history, measuring paternal and maternal uh, calciums. And if they are also hypercalcemic, asymptomatic, leave them alone, just counsel, uh, just genetic counseling, that's all. Uh, whereas the three can be hypercalcemic and actually 75% have cognitive defects also have been described. The life-threatening condition I said was neonatal severe hyperparathyroidism, which is either auto, mostly autosomal recessive because of the two gene involvement and can requires parathyroidectomy. Nowadays, cynic LCID has been used as a temporizing measure before eventually getting parathyroidectomy. And uh, there is uh, something called adult onset parathyroidism where CSR is mutated. And this also can cause what there also you have more nephrolithiasis. So what are the symptoms of hypercalcemia? As you know, stones, bones, moans, groans, and also shortened QTC interval. Uh, so uh, this is the shortened QTC interval, nephrocalcinosis, and uh, band keratitis due to hypercalcemia, itchy, gritty, painful eyes, red eye. It's one of the causes. And so approach to hypercalcemia, again, take a thorough dietary history, any extra calcium supplementation, vitamin D supplementation, stop them. Medication history is, are they on thiazides? I mean, that's, those are the only, the, but that should be quite clear. Family history, physical examination, any bony deformities, et cetera, and parental details. And of course, uh, sometimes they will require going on to uh, do, of course, the panel, full panel, par parathyroid, phosphate, electrolytes, creatinine, vitamin D, ca urine calcium creatinine ratio, especially useful in CSR disorders, vitamin D levels. Um, I don't usually do PTH related peptide. I have not required that. Um, and then system EV scan is done to see if there is any adenoma or anything uh, impacting the parathyroid gland. It's a nuclear medicine scan where the parathyroid will light up. If, I mean, hypercellular parathyroid will light up if there is a localized adenoma or tumor. And urine calcium creatinine ratios should be done. And treatment usually is hydration, hydration, and hydration, and forced diuresis. So that will help to get rid of the extra calcium. Uh, and furosemide, if you block the uh, uh, furosemide, remember it's a loop diuretic acting on the sodium potassium 2 chloride channel. If you block that, calcium absorption will be reduced. Again, calcium will be lost in urine. And then bisphosphonates are also used in severe hypercalcemia. Uh, steroids can be given in autoimmune causes. Uh, so it depends on the cause. Not everybody will get, most of the children will just respond to hydration and furosemide. Bisphosphonate is for prolonged condition and uh, steroids for autoimmune condition. So the idea is mainly to increase the urinary excretion of calcium. 
Specific treatment depends on uh, like cause. If it is hyperparathyroidism due to adenoma or something, then it will require parathyroidectomy or neonatal severe hyperparathyroidism. As I discussed, they will require calcium imaging. If there's dietary problem, then stop all the supplements. Of course, that's the first thing. And sometimes very rarely dialysis will be required. So coming to the calcium imaging and calcilytics, very few uh, last few slides. So fooling the calcium sensing receptors. So in recent years, uh, newer medications have been developed after the discovery of this CSR in 1990s. Uh, uh, we, uh, we thought, we, I mean, the pharma industries have been doing a lot of research. And now there are two drug, broad categories of the drugs. One are calcium mimetic and one are calcilytics, similar to the activating and inactivating mutations, as I discussed. So increase, calcium mimetics act like calcium basically and increase the CSR sensitivity to calcium. So the word is descriptive, calcium mimetic, calcium light, and calci calcilytic, which reduces the sensitivity to calcium. So they do exactly the same thing as the mutation. Calcium mimetics increase the sensitivity to the calcium and calcilytics decrease the sensitivity to the calcium. And hence PTA secretion in the calcium mimetic agents, PTA secretion is reduced. And this is the desired effect. Cinecalcid is already in the market and is already being used in end-stage kidney uh, uh, to treat the CKD mineral bone disease in, and especially in end-stage kidney disease and there are guidelines available to guide the therapy, European guidelines. Um, etel caseltide is a newer drug which I haven't used, but it's in, the advantage is it's injectable and it's approved for use in patients with severe secondary hyperparathyroidism in ESKD. So they can get, I, hemodialysis patients can get it each time they come for the dialysis, you know, so it's not requiring any extra effort to daily cinecalcet, which my children have to take daily. Uh, indications are primary hyperparathyroidism, treatment of uh, CKD, MBD and CKD, as I said, and also the inherited hypercalcemic disorders, uh, especially the neonatal severe one or symptomatic familial, not the asymptomatic one, but if they are symptomatic, severe symptomatic, then they can be used. Uh, yeah, I think we have already said that uh, the differences between Cinecalcid and Etel cell that they are first generation, second generation differences in IV and oral. And, uh, and this is the position statement from the European Society of Pediatric Nephrology to, for the use of Cinecalcid in CKD mineral bone disease. So this is quite widely available, freely available. And this is, I, I use it often to guide my therapy for Cinecalcid in children with CK and stage kidney disease and severe um, you know, CKD, MBD, where I can't control the PTH. And once I start giving calcium, bind, uh, calcium binding, I mean, phosphate binding uh, binders with uh, calcium, the calcium starts rising. That's how we use it. Calcilytic agents reduce the sensitivity of the CSR to calcium and shift the concentration response curve to right. Um, and so they have been developed, they were initially developed to treat osteoporosis, but in that they did not show efficacy. More recently, they have been used in the autosomal dominant, sorry, autosomal dominant hypocalcemia, and they have been shown in a small case studies to help these patients. So to summarize, calcium sensing receptor senses small changes in serum ionized calcium concentration and allows the changes in the PTS secretion. And the end game is always to normalize the serum calcium concentration. An inactivating mutation of the CSR causes familial hypocalcuric hypercalcemia, and at the rough end of the spectrum is neonatal severe hyperparathyroidism. In most cases, the familial hyper uh, of FFH parathyroid surgery is not required nor appropriate, and it's only required if symptoms. Whereas uh, total parathyroidectomy is treatment of choice for uh, the neonatal severe form. And sometimes as a temporizing measure, we may require bisphosphonate and sinecalcid before surgery is undertaken. Activating mutations called autosomal dominant hypocalcemia and Barter syndrome type 5 also. Uh, uh, and uh, the sinecalcid has a, a, a calcium mimetic is already in clinical use. Calcium mimetics and calcilytics hold promise for other inherited and acquired disorder of CSR. So we'll carefully watch this space. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Uh, Thank you, Dr. Swasti. Can you stop sharing your slide? Yeah, sure.
Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swasti. That was an excellent, a very lucid presentation. I would say the complex, the simple. That's how I would, uh, you know, uh, say that your presentation was a good. Uh, you dealt it in a very lucid manner. Thank you so Thank much. You. So uh, now our second speaker for the day is Dr. Kalevani Ganeshan. Uh, she is a senior consultant in Department of Pediatric Nephrology, Mehta Multi Specialty Hospitals, India Private Limited and a visiting consultant at Rela Institute and Medical Center. Her areas of expertise include critical care nephrology, glomerular diseases, and chronic kidney disease. She has won numerous awards and honors, awardee of World Kidney Day Project 2022, recipient of ISN grant for 2018, 19, and 22, ex-executive committee member of Nephrology Association of Tam Tamil Nadu and Puducherry, reviewer of clinical uh, nephrology journal, reviewer of International Journal of Nephrology, and member of ISN and IPNA. Uh, she has few national and international publications in reputed journals and authored few textbooks, chapters in their textbooks. So over to Dr. Kalaiwani for the talk. Thank you, Dr. Shweta, for the kind introduction. Are my slides visible in full screen? Yeah, they are. Yeah. So today I'll be discussing on lab evaluation of tubular disorders. So like uh, we'll have a brief introduction. How do we go about lab evaluation of tubular disorders? So the assessment of glomerular and tubular function is uh, essentially important in early detection and management of kidney disease. One second, I'll just change my name. So the common disorders of tubular function is you can have uh, your, so actually what uh, derivation we get from the lab evaluation is it helps us to actually identify the renal diseases earlier. And it uh, not only helps in uh, identifying the renal diseases, it also helps in determining the progression of uh, kidney disease and also helps us in monitoring the response to treatment. So the common disorders of tubular function or your, uh, you can have different segments involved in your tubular function to be assessed. If you have a proximal tubule which is involved, then you have a, pro a phosphate transport, glucose transport and amino acid transport involved in it, causing hypophosphatemic rickets. You can have renal glycosuria. Uh, you can have isolated or generalized amino acid urea. If you have involvement of your ascending limb of uh, Henle, then you have more of electrolyte disturbances like sodium, potassium, and chloride transporter defects leading on to Barter syndrome. And if you have a distal tubule which is involved, you have more of hydrogen ion secretion defects leading on to distal renal tubular acidosis. And if you have your collecting duct which is involved, you can have uh, water transport defects leading on to nephrogenic DI. So like assessment of tubular function can be categorized into two things. You can have your proximal tubule invo involving in uh, tubular function assessment, or you can have your distal tubules. So we'll first look into the proximal tubular functions. So in case if you have a proximal tubule, which is uh, not functioning well, then you might have defects in your tubular handling of your sodium, your glucose, phosphate, calcium, bicarbonate, and few amino acids. And if you have your distal tubule, which is involved, you might have land up with potassium secretion defects, or you might have defect in your uh, urinary acidification and your urinary concentration defects. So first we look into the assessment of proximal tubular function. So first coming onto the list of proximal tubular function test is your glucose. So normally around 300 milligram per day per 1.73 meter square of glucose is excreted and your dipstick is good enough to pick up your uh, glucosuria. But you can still get uh, the negative dipstick if you have a diluted urine. So it is mandatory that uh, even if you have a negative dipstick, it is better to go ahead doing a biochemical measurement such as your Benetics test. 
So in case if you have a glucosuria, glycosuria can be due to increased filtered load as in a, seen in diabetes mellitus, or you can have an incomplete reabsorption of normal filtered loads as uh, seen in your tubular defects, that is renal glycosuria. So you need to uh, have a simultaneous blood glucose measurement done. So next on the list is your phosphorus handling by your proximal tubules. So it is well known that your uh, proximal tubule handles maximum of your phosphate load. So plasma phosphate levels thus uh, is an indicator of renal tubular handling. So when you, you need to have a look on your fractional excretion of your phosphorus, it has to be done in a timed urine, um, especially your uh, fasting morning sample has to be taken into consideration. And you can collect it for two hours, four hours or six hours, but uh, routinely we don't do it over 24 hours. And uh, you should have a blood sampling also done, which is essentially done in midway of your, your uh, urine collection. And so your uh, tubular reabsorption of phosphate is calculated from your fractional excretion of your phosphorus. So normally what happens is 5 to 12% of phosphate is excreted uh, routinely, but your tubular reabsorption of phosphorus should be around 88 to 95% to tell that your proximal tubule is functioning well. So phosphate wasting is usually seen in Fanconi syndrome. So how do we calculate fractional excretion of phosphorus? It is routinely done. You need to check your urine phosphate, which has to be multiplied by your plasma creatinine upon your plasma phosphate multiplied by your urine creatinine into 100. And from that, you have to calculate your tubular reabsorption of phosphorus. That is done. Uh, your, it is 100 minus your fractional excretion of your phosphorus. So if you have a TRP, uh, if uh, TRP is not satisfactory in case if you have a, a GFR which is reduced. So you need to actually like correlate with your GFR. So tubular maximum for phosphorus is corrected for your GFR and is independent of your plasma phosphorus and your renal functions. And how do we calculate TMP GFR is by you need to have a plasma phosphate uh, minus your urine phosphate multiplied by your plasma creatinine upon your urine creatinine. So under TMP, G, uh, GFR is usually age dependent and it needs to be uh, looked upon according to the age appropriate reference values. So the normal TMP GFR ranges between 2.8 to 4.4 milligram per deciliter and it is low in older children. So when you have both your uh, serum phosphate and your TMP GFR are low, it indicates that your tubules are at fault and it indicates that a phosphate is getting leaked more, for, uh, more so seen in Fanconi syndrome. If you have a normal or high TMP GFR, it is indicative that renal conservation of phosphate is happening. Hence, a non-renal cause of hypophosphatemia needs to be taught. So this is a graph which is called as Bijovitz index. This uh, uh, helps us to calculate the TMP GFR. This represents a serum phosphate concentration above which most phosphate would get excreted and below which most is reabsorbed. Say for example, if a child is presenting with a um, serum potassium uh, phosphate of around the three and your uh, uh, excretion TMP GFR is around 2. You need to plot a line between 2 and your serum phosphate of that uh, child, which is 3. So it comes around uh, 0 0.7. 0 0.7 of TRP is nothing but 70%. So it indicates that anything you know, like your tubular reabsorption of phosphorus has to be between uh, more than 88%, between 88 to 95%. So this uh, value of uh, 0.7 is 70%. So it means that there is some amount of phosphate loss in the urine. So this is a Bejovitz normogram, which is routinely used to calculate the TMP GFR value. Next on the list to check the phosphate uh, for your proximal tubular function is your calcium. So you label a child as having hypercalciuria when your urine calcium exceeds four milligram per kg per day in a 24 hours urine sample. And if you're going to do a urine spot values, then it is always preferred to have a second void in the morning, especially after an overnight fast, which correlates with the 24 hours urine collection. 
this will actually help us to rule out your absorptive hypercalciuria. So this are, these are the normal values which are age dependent. The normal spot urine calcium creatinine value, if it is less than six months, it is 0.8 milligram per milligram. If it is between six months to 12 months, it is 0.6 milligram per milligram. Between one to two years, it is 0.5. And in older children's more than two years, it is 0.2 milligram per milligram of creatinine. And hypercalciuria with nephrocalcinosis can be seen in few conditions like Barter syndrome. So next thing to assess for proximal tubule is your bicarbonate loading test. That is your fractional excretion of bicarbonate is a good marker of your bicarbonate handling. So when you have a serum, bicarbonate level uh, has to be uh, restored to normal value before you have a collection of your urine sample for your uh, bicarbonate uh, test. So to uh, restore the normal values, you need to load the child with sodium bicarbonate. You need to uh, uh, instill at least half of the dose, that is 0.5 milliclans per ml at a rate of 3 ml per minute to a peripheral line. And you need to measure a pH, urine pH at a regular intervals, which is taken 30 to 60 minutes apart. And a steady state is achieved after three to four hours of start of infusion. And the test needs to be terminated when three timed urine collection shows a urine pH of more than 7.5. And uh, apart from giving IV uh, bicarbonate, it can be uh, done oral uh, with oral solution or oral tablet formulation as well. In that case, the oral dose is around two to four milliclans per kg per day, which needs to be given for at least three to four days prior to doing the bicarbonate loading test. And this bicarbonate loading test usually helps us to identify the type of renal tubular acidosis, but it is not routinely done in our day-to-day -day practice. And how do we calculate the fractional excretion of bicarbonate? So it is calculated by urine bicarbonate multiplied by your plasma creatinine upon your plasma bicarbonate multiplied by your urine creatinine. So like before calculating the fractional excretion of bicarbonate, the, it has to be, or the child has to be adequately alkalized. So normally uh, almost uh, bicarbonate, uh, almost all bicarbonate is reabsorbed in proximal tubule. So when you have a serum bicarbonate of more than 22 milliclans and, uh, and your fractional excretion of bicarbonate is more than 15%, then it indicates you have the child has got proximal renal tubular acidosis. And when you have a child with a normal range of uh, serum bicarbonate and your fractional excretion of bicarbonate is less than 5%, then it is an indicator for distal renal tubular acidosis. Next, how do we calculate your urine to blood uh, uh, CO2? So uh, most of the most of the H plus is uh, secreted in your distal tubule, which reacts with your luminal bicarbonate. So in alkaline urine, your uh, plasma CO2 increases because of your distal secretion of your H plus uh, ions. So in normal individuals, usually the urine pH will be more than 7.5 with a plasma bicarbonate of between 23 to 25. And your uh, urine PCO2 will be more than 70 and your urine to blood PCO2 has to be more than 20. Whereas in distal RPA, the urine PCO2 will be less than 50 and your urine to blood PCO2 will be less than 10, which is indicative of your distal RPA. Next on the list will be your fractional excretion of your sodium. So uh, this uh, may one of, one of the function is uh, fractional excretion of uh, sodium is uh, how do we calculate it? It is usually done by uh, urine sodium multiplied by your plasma creatinine upon your plasma sodium multiplied by your urine creatinine into 100. Usually in pre-renal AKI, the fractional excretion of uh, sodium will be less than 1%. It is because when you have a volume depleted status, your kidneys, your tubules tries to con uh, conserve a lot of sodium. So in turn, so whenever sodium is uh, conserved, you have water uh, which is being dragged in. So your circulatory volume status is sort of conserved. So whenever you have a child with a pre-renal AKI, your fractional excretion of sodium will be less than 1%, indicating that your more sodium is conserved. Whereas in intrinsic renal uh, failure, you will have a fractional excretion of sodium, which is more than 2%.
but the fractional excretion of sodium is not reliable when you have a child who is on diuretics. In that uh, situation, you need to consider your fractional excretion of your urea. In, if your fractional excretion of urea is less than 35%, it indicates low effective circulatory volume. Next is your assessment of distal tubular function. How do we assess the distal function? The first thing in, uh, is your plasma anion gap. So your plasma anion gap helps us to uh, differentiate between your measured cations and anions. And anion gap is calculated by your sodium minus your chloride plus your uh, bicarbonate. Usually in normal state, the unmeasured anions are your phosphate albumin and uh, in uh, unmeasured cations are your potassium and calcium. And the majority of your measured uh, you, uh, cation is your sodium and your measured, uh, 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 measured anions are your bicarbonate and chloride. So that is why we consider so, um, the majority of your uh, measured ca cation as uh, sodium minus your uh, chloride plus bicarbonate. So normal value is between 10 to 12 milliequivalents per liter. And so this value will actually help us to differentiate between normal and high anion gap metabolic acidosis. So your anion gap can still be low in case if you have if the child has got hypoalbuminemia. In that case, you need to apply this formula that is your measured anion gap plus 2.3 multiplied by 4 minus your serum albumin. And so this will help us to give the uh, corrected uh, albumin with the anion gap. So next, after your plasma anion gap comes your urinary anion gap. So how do we calculate urinary anion gap? It is your urinary sodium plus your uh, urinary potassium plus your unmeasured cations, which is equivalent to urinary chloride plus your unmeasured anions. So the formula is urinary sodium plus your urinary potassium minus your urinary chloride. So in case of metabolic acidosis, the majority of the uh, hydrogen ion is excreted as ammonium chloride. That is ammonia is being excreted. So that is the reason your urinary sodium plus your urinary potassium will be less than your urinary chloride. Whereas in children with distal RTA, you have distal acidification defects. So your urinary sodium and your urinary potassium will be more than your urinary chloride. So you will have a positive gap. But you have few caveats in urinary anion gap measurement. You can negative urinary anion gap always does not indicate uh, ammonium excretion. It can be interfered when you have ketones or hypocrates excreted in the urine, and few drugs also can interfere with it, such as penicillin and the lithium. And validity of urinary anion gap is uh, estimating your ammonium plus excretion is limited if the urine pH is more than 6.5. So distal delivery of your sodium is required for acidification and your urinary anion gap is unreliable if the urinary sodium is less than 20 millimoles per liter. So next test for distal uh, tubular function is your urine osmolar gap. So how do we calculate urine osmolar gap? It is a measured urine. It is your measured urinary osmolarity minus your calculated urine osmolarity. How do we calculate the calculated urine osmolarity? Is your two multiplied by your sodium plus your potassium plus um, uh, multiplied by your bun in milligram per deciliter upon 2.8 plus urinary glucose in milligram per uh, deciliter upon 18. So the normal urine osmolar gap is approximately 10 to 100 milliosmoles per kg. And uh, your urinary ammonium excretion is approximately just half of this value. It's basically because due to the accompanying anions. So the next test we need to perform is uh, your urine pH, which is commonly done in our routine day-to-day -day practice. So it is a known fact that kidneys help in acid-base balance of the body. So whenever you're checking for a urine pH, it has to be a, essentially a fresh uh, void and early morning sample has to be done. The normal range is between 4.5 to 8. And uh, it can be measured either by your dipstick method or it can be done by your pH meter. 
So if you have an early morning urine pH of less than 5.5, it, uh, it, it indicates that you, your tubules have, are having a good acidification. If you have a urine pH more than 7, then it, uh, it is indicative you have a defective acidification where seen in your distal RPE. Next is your acid load test. So this actually helps us to evaluate the renal acidification by inducing metabolic acidosis. And so how do we induce metabolic acidosis? Is by uh, injecting ammonium chloride. It is given at a, a 0.5 milligram per kg. It can be given orally to induce uh, marked systemic acidemia. That is your blood pH has to be essentially less than 7.2 and your plasma bicarbonate has to be less than 15. So you need to induce metabolic, you need to induce acidosis before you could actually do this test. And urine is collected for next four to eight hours. If the urine pH is more than 5.5, in spite of significant systemic acidemia, then it is more towards diagnosis of distal renal tubular acidosis. But it is not routinely done in our day-to-day -day practice. Next is your uh, fruzimide test. So fruzimide, uh, it blocks your sodium potassium 2 chloride pumps in the loop of Henle. So whenever you give a fruzimide, it actually increases the delivery of your sodium and it causes sodium reabsorption in the distal tubule. This actually induces your voltage mediated H plus ion and your potassium secretion. So what is a normal response whenever you give a fruzimide is? It increases the net acid secretion, which leading to lowering of your urine pH to less than 5.3 and it causes caluresis. So an abnormal fruzimide test indicates that you have either a secretory or a voltage dependent distal acidification defect. Next on the list for uh, distal function is your potassium handling. So like your potassium uh, handling depends on how much of potassium is uh, we take on our day-to-day -day practice. And it also depends on your delivery of your sodium and ingestion of water as well. And the ma major player is your aldosterone. Uh, aldosterone. So when you are collecting a random urine sample and your potassium is more than 20 milliequivalents per liter in patient, with hypokalemia, it indicates that there is renal uh, potassium wasting. So the TTKG reflects the aldosterone activity in the distal tubule. The TTKG is nothing but a transtubular potassium gradient, which is calculated by urine potassium multiplied upon your plasma osmolality upon your plasma potassium multiplied by your urine osmolality. So you are like the prerequisite to do TTKG is your urine osmolality has to be more than your uh, serum osmolality and your uh, urinary sodium has to be more than 25. So in case of hyperkalemia, uh, your TTKG will be less than 5 to 7, which actually indicates that the child is having either reduced or resistant to aldosterone. Uh, like in hypokalemia, it is of uh, less use. So next is your test for urinary concentration defects. So your uh, kidney uh, also plays an important role in water homeostasis. And so like the water reabsorption takes place majorly in your proximal convoluted tubule, your thin uh, descending limb of loop of Henle and your collecting duct. So the concentration ability of the kidney can be uh, checked by checking your urine specific gravity, your urine and plasma osmolality, and by performing a water deprivation test. And so how do we check your uh, urine specific gravity? So urine specific gravity is a measure of your dissolved solute particles in the urine. And uh, it is measured by using either refractometer, urinometer, and it can also be checked by reagent strip. It can be increased in, ca in, uh, in case if the child is having glucose, proteins, or radio contrast materials in the urine. So usually urine specific gravity is checked in your early morning urine sample. And uh, when you have a specific gravity of more than 10-10, uh, it is indicative of good concentration. And in case of uh, CKD, uh, the tubular function is lost. So you might have a constant low specific gravity.
Next test is your urine osmolarity. The osmolarity reflects the osmotically active molecules in the solute and is expressed in millimole per kg of water. So it is checked by using freezing point method and plasma and urine osmolarity has to be checked simultaneously for a better interpretation. So the normal range is uh, plasma osmolarity has to be between 280 to 295, uh, 295 milliosmoles per kg and your urine osmolarity has to be always double of your plasma osmolarity. And you can have as low as 40 millimoles per kg in case of water excess states. And you can have a high urine osmolarity of 1,400 milliosmoles per kg in case of water restricted states. So what does our urine osmolarity tells us? So in case if you have a child with hyponatremia and a low urine osmolarity, it is indicative of water intoxication. When you have hyponatremia with a high urine osmolality, it is suggestive of dehydration with excess urinary sodium loss. If you have hypernatremia and low urine osmolality, it is suggestive of polyuria as in case of diabetes insipidus. When you have hypernatremia and high urine osmolality, it is suggestive of excessive salt ingestion. So next is your water deprivation test. So what are all the indications to perform water deprivation test? So it is uh, it helps us to differentiate a suspected uh, diabetes insipidus from your primary polydipsia. So how do we perform this test? It requires a real close monitoring. So in uh, pediatric population, overnight fasting is usually not recommended uh, just to avoid dehydration. And uh, we recommend light uh, breakfast with minimal fluid intake in the early morning before the test. And an intravenous cannula is uh, inserted and the bladder needs to be catheterized only in case of the child is non toilet trained. And we start the test after uh, emptying the early morning uh, urine and all oral fluids and IV, uh, all oral fluids needs to be st stopped. I mean, you need to have a watch on urine void, the measurement, measure urine volume and your urine osmolality and the weight needs to be checked at regular intervals and your vital signs also needs to be monitored on hourly basis. And you need to check for your plasma sodium osmolality every second hourly till the conclusion of the test. So the test is terminated when one of the following endpoints are at, uh, attained. When you have a urine osmolality, which is more than 600 milliosmoles per kg, or when you have a urine specific gravity, which is already more than 1.020, or when you have a plasma osmolality, which exceeds 285 milliosmoles per kg, or in case if you have a plasma sodium of more than 145, per liter, then you are not allowed to perform the test or you need to terminate the test. And uh, if in case of the child has lost weight, which is more than 5% of the body weight, then you need to terminate the test. Or if you feel if the period of water restriction has reached, according to the age group, if it is less than six months and the water restriction phase has exceeded six hours and between six months to two years, if the water restriction period is more than eight hours, and if it is more than two years, if the water restriction period is more than 12 hours, then it means that you, are, you need to terminate the test. So how do we interpret uh, water deprivation test? So you need to have a basal osmolality and uh, post uh, water deprivation osmolality. Your uh, basal plasma osmolality, if it is less than 295 and your urine osmolality is more than 600, it, uh, you need not go ahead doing a water deprivation test at all. And if your uh, basal osmolality is less than 295 and your urine osmolality is less than 300, and after performing a water deprivation test, if the uh, plasma osmolality has increased to more than 295 and your urine osmolality is more than 300 to 600, then it is suggestive of your primary polydipsia. And if your basal osmolality is less than 295 and urine is less than 300 and after water deprivation, if your uh, plasma osmolality is more than 295 and your urine osmolality is less than 300, then it is suggestive of your diabetes insipidus.
So then we go ahead uh, performing a desmopressin test. And so this desmopressin test actually helps us to distinguish between your central DI and your nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. What are all the prerequisites to perform this uh, test? So impaired urinary concentration, when your urine uh, osmolality is less than 600 milliosmoles, despite reaching a plasma osmolality of 295 milliosmoles per kg or your plasma sodium of 145 milliequivalents per liter. And if you feel the child has lost more than 5% of the baseline body weight, and in case if you are actually like um, terminating the test due to time constraints, as already mentioned in the previous slide, depending upon the age group. So like a desmopressin test, the like urine and uh, your osmolality are measured every 30 minutes for next four hours to look for the antidiuretic response. And um, it can be done by giving either nasal desmopressin or an intramuscular dose. Usually what is being performed all these days is you're giving a nasal dose. And your nasal dose depends upon the age group. Less than two years, it is five mics in each nostril. Between two to eight years, it is 7.5. Between eight to 14, it is 10. And more than 14 years, you can give 10 mics in each nostrils. And so how do we interpret the desmopressin test? So in case of complete nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, your urine osmolality will be less than 300 and uh, percentage of elevation of your urine uh, osmolality will be less than 15% in case of your complete nephrogenic DI. If it is partial nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, your urine osmolality will be less than 300 and your percentage of elevation of urine osmolality will be less than 45% in case of partial. In case of partial central uh, DI, you will have a urine osmolality which is more than 300 and your percentage of elevation of urine osmolality will be between 15 to 50%. In case of complete central DI, your again, your urine osmolality will be more than 300 and your percentage of elevation of urine osmolality will be more than 50%. And so this is how we need to interpret your desmopressin test. So in case if you have a newborn or an infant, you need to perform desmopressin test. Uh, so it is a little different protocol. So because uh, water restriction cannot be performed in such cases, so uh, preferred diagnostic test is you need to administer uh, desmopressin that is 0 0.05 mics either subcutaneously or IV over 20 minutes. And the maximum dose you can use is only 0.4 mcg per kg body weight of the child. And um, measurement of urine osmolality at baseline needs to be done and every 30 minutes interval over the next two hours. If the urine osmolality does not increase more than 100, so if the urine osmolality does not increase more than 100 milliosmoles per kg over the baseline, it is suggestive of uh, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. And so how do we interpret next uh, would be the final thing uh, is your genetic analysis. So genetic analysis uh, will help us in identifying the transporters. And so there, uh, thereby identifying the transporters will actually help us to know the pathogenesis of the disease. And it will also help us in offering a better treatment. So knowing uh, the specific gene involved in these transporter uh, defects uh, helps us in prognostication and it also helps in long-term outcome evaluation of your and also to look into the extra renal phenotype. And also it will also help us in uh, giving a better counseling. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kalaiwani. Uh, that was an excellent uh, talk on uh, various uh, functions of the renal tubules and the investigations pertaining to the same. Um, so, yeah, thank you so much for the talk. So, there are no questions from the audience as of now. So, yeah. So, uh, any comments from? I have one, two comments. Yes, sir. The most dangerous seas are the Pacific and the Atlantic. The two subjects chosen by you 
for this year, ladies are equally dangerous, talking about CASR and tubular functions. And both have done it so extremely well. I congratulate them. It's a very difficult topic because a lot of matters got to go into it within the 40 minutes, and it was made so simple for people to understand. Both have done very well. I congratulate them. Thank you very much. Dr. Sweta, your comments, Sweta? Yeah. So basically, uh, Dr. Kalevani, that was an excellent talk. And uh, when we talk about renal tubular disorders and the various values and all, it is important to know the normal from the abnormal for various age groups. So like we say that we have to evaluate for hyperkalemia in a child. And what we have to know over there that for a neonate up to even up to six uh, milliequivalents of uh, potassium is normal and that does not need any evaluation. Then things like, you know, the practical things like we have to basically check whether it's a live sample or not, whether there's hemolysis and all those things. I mean, just the basic uh, practical things to be kept in mind. And uh, for like Dr. Swasti, again, your talk was excellent. And, uh, you know, this, uh, this topic of calcium sensing uh, receptor disorders. I mean, I also got reading about the topic when I saw this, uh, you know, that uh, I had to moderate the session. And there were some in interesting things that I found that, you know, this, these calcium sensing receptors are present on almost so many cells in the body, you know, in the pancreas where it can cause pancreatitis, in gallbladder where it can cause gallstones. In fact, it's present on the breast ductal cells, and that's why th that's where okay. the importance of uh, supplementing uh, calcium to the uh, lactating mother, because you know what happens yeah. that uh, it directly stimulates the calcium sensing receptors in the breast yeah. ductal cells, and yeah. that leads to secretion. It re uh, regulates the secretion of the calcium into the breast milk. So, all these yeah. are very interesting things that I found. By yeah, no, thank, thank you for you covering know, it. Reading the topic, so. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you for bringing that because in the interest of time, I could not do it. So that that's good that you're pointing so, I mean, it out. That, that really caught my attention. You know, there's th these are such simple things. When we talk about calcium, we think about okay, renal, the parathyroid hormone to some extent. You know, the uh, the thyroid gland. But then when you start looking at the skeleton system, but when you see it's there everywhere, and that's yeah. why I said that your topic you made complex to simple. You know, the way you did yeah. dealt with the topic, yeah. Yeah, in one of the paper review articles, I saw the whole body had CSR and I was like, I can't cover this much. <laughs> so because then I had to choose what I have to cover from the renal perspective. And uh, and the rest, I, I mean, it actually recently it has also been uh, known to play a role in neoplasms. And as I said, some neoplasms, some cancers, it is, it is promoter and in some is it acts as almost like a tumor suppressor. So there's a lot that uh, people can go and read about it. It's very interesting. And of course, the calcium mimetics and calcilytics are exciting drugs on horizon. Especially for us, we use calcium mimetic. I, I'm sure you all of us have used um, Cinecalcid. I had yeah. to use it because all my patients went on eventually. I tried with calcium-based uh, binder, but it could not be controlled because calcium started rising. Yeah, so calcium anyway. sensing receptor mutations are seen associated with the breast and colon cancers, and that's where the genetic yeah. analysis also helps over there, probably. Yeah, and it's not only that, these are the actual mutations, but there are polymorphisms, mm -hmm. which will make you more susceptible as well. If you read into it more, in more detail, the more you dive, the more you... Yeah, yeah, this is like... I mean, I plan to continue with this reading because I really found the topic so interesting and so enriching. It was like, you know, one after another, things kept coming yeah. up so i was like okay yeah, yeah. it's like um, i'm di digressing a bit but it's like the barter mutations like the if there are polymorphisms in population actually you don't have if it is mutated of course you have a severe phenotype of barter syndrome but polymorphisms of the sodium channels and the chloride channels lead to the blood pressure uh, differentials in and la large population sets so the you know mutation is different and polymorphism if there is then it will uh, uh, change your patient uh, mm. totally differs and that's yeah. where you have to have that you know knowledge and index of suspicion for the yeah for the disease that you're looking at yeah mm. okay. these are rare disorders but at least they're i think their um, knowledge of them is important and especially with the drugs in the market the knowledge is important but overall import uh, knowledge of hypocalcemia and hypercalcemia we find every day in our practice isn't it we may not detect a mutation, a rare disorder, but uh, these are things we deal with every day. Absolutely. So, appro Thank you. Thank you.
so much. Oh, yeah, thank you, Dr. Swasti and uh, Dr. Kalavani for an excellent uh, talk. And as, as Dr. Namalmar said, you know, those two difficult topics, you made it so easy for us to understand. And uh, Dr. Swasti, I really liked, you know, the, how you started with the, you know, the basics of hypercalcemia, hypocalcemia, and then you went on to describe the calcium sensing receptors, and then also the newer drugs which are in the market. So thank you so much for uh, doing that. And, uh, you know, Sinakel said, you know, even we have started to use it more and more here. And um, it's, a, it's a very interesting drug, I feel sometimes, you know, uh, it needs close monitoring. Yeah, because you definitely. start with hypercalcemia and then you may go yeah. up on the other side, uh, you know, on the hypocalcemia side. So I would like yeah. to, you know, hear your, uh, you know, experience with this drug and, uh, you know, how frequently you monitor calciums and have you noticed hypocalcemia uh, when you are using these? Yeah, definitely. So, so I have noticed hypocalcemia, as you rightly said, because I, obviously it's a calcimimetic, so uh, it will, you know, it will cause a drop in calcium and that's the intention of using it. But on you have to, I monitor actually weekly. And as I said, in my talk, I follow the European guidelines. They, they provide very detailed guidelines and I will request everybody to have a look at them. Uh, Ruxana Shroff is one of the, I think, uh, key authors with that paper. Um, and as you know, she has done a lot of work in this area. So um, uh, I start with the smallest possible dose. It's, it's usually started in above three years of age. And uh, we have to do an uh, QT interval, like uh, do a baseline ECG and make sure that the QT interval is not prolonged. And there are certain drugs which should not be given, uh, like simultaneously the drugs which prolong the QTC interval, like macrolides and other drugs, which may interfere, like also lead to arrhythmias. And then we start very slowly, like 0.2 milligram per kg. I think the max dose is don't go, uh, 2.5 milligram per kg. Uh, so we're starting from like less than 10 fold and weekly calcium, and I did see hypocalcemia, Amrish, and I had to, I, despite doing all these uh, uh, steps, and the child actually we had a headache, so headache can be a sign of hypocalcemia. Immediately I did calcium and it was low. So I had to stop sinicalcet, make sure it normalizes. I didn't give calcium, of course, because that will, high, with high phosphate, you cannot give calcium, and these children have high phosphate. So, but I just waited, and it improved with just calcitriol, and stopping the sinicalcet. Uh, so yeah, really close monitoring is required. No, thank you so much for sharing that experience because you know that becomes really important for all of us. And uh, the newer drugs come into the market and uh, and they're good, I mean, no question, but at the same time, as you mentioned, they need very strict monitoring. So thank you so much for sharing your experience and thank you also you know, for pointing us towards the European guidelines, which are very thorough. So thank you for both of those comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kalevani. Thank you, Dr. Swasti. Thank you, Dr. Amrish. And okay. thank you, Namal Varsa. Thank you for today's session. Thank you. So yeah, thank you, Dr. Thank Shweta, you. for running such an excellent session. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you again to both the speakers. Uh, we do have a polling session just to follow. So if you want to stay back for the polling sessions, please do stay back. I know Dr. Swasti, it is late for you there in Australia, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you're welcome it, to stay back if you would like. So. It's like 12 midnight, so I might take a break and then, uh, yeah, thank you so much for all for inviting me. I always learn when I do these talks, as Dr. Shweta rightly pointed out, I also learned so many new things when I was starting to research, I mean, start reading articles on this paper. So thank you, Dr. Kalavani and Dr. Amrish, Dr. Namalwar and everybody in the panel actually. Um, so, so yeah, no worries. I will leave now. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. The three ladies have done very well. I think we must congratulate them. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Bye, Shri. Bye, everybody. Bye. 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 Good night. Bye, bye, man. Good, Good night. night. Hi. We'll go ahead with the polling session next. So, people who you know, trainees want to stay back for the polling session, please stay back. You want to read out the instructions for the polling session, English? Uh, sure. Yeah, so participants are requested to enter proper email ID and contact number during the process of registration for the, case, for the ease of future communication. Uh, there are a total of six polling sessions. And as you know, there are two more left. So take advantage. One is today and then one is uh, next week uh, on August 10th. 
each polling session will have 10 questions and it's mandatory to answer all the questions, you know, to proceed with submission. You'll have a total of 10 minutes a time to answer these questions. There'll be three star questions in each session and each star questions uh, are taken into consideration in case of a tie. Uh, we will, you know, we will add all the scores of the six polling sessions and then the final results will be declared. Uh, only trainees are allowed to participate in the polling session, but mentees, you know, mentors, they can still read the questions and still check their knowledges. So please go ahead, uh, but they will not be able to participate in the uh, prize winning. And we request that all participants to log in, uh, log on time using a bigger screen so that you can easily view those questions. And uh, it's better to view them on iPad or tab uh, using a landscape mode. Once you log into the webinar, you can avail the polling sessions in the same link during the webinar session. So Dr. Kalavani would be showing us the polling questions. Well, there's a little change in the timing alone. It's not total 10 minutes, it's uh, seven minutes. Okay, thank you for making it harder. <laughs> and we have the poll questions. So the poll starts now.
We have got 30 seconds left. I think we'll close the polls now. I hope it was not too tough for everybody. So thank you once again for joining the session today. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shweta, for running the uh, session today. And thanks again for joining. Uh, thanks to all the speakers and Dr. Kalavani, especially to you for uh, stepping in at the last minute. And uh, thank you so much for your wonderful talk. Dr. Namalwar has left and um, thanks again for him to joining uh, to the session today. And thanks to Dr. Manoj and Dr. Swasti uh, for their parts. Uh, thanks again for all the attendees for uh, coming in. Uh, this will conclude the session. Thank you, Dr. Shweta. Thank you, Dr. Shweta. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Amrish. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, Kalavani.